Turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts for a moment. Then we're going to come back to Matthew, or go back, we're going to go to Matthew. <clears throat> what I found interesting about Easter is that everybody understands, and, and rightly so, everybody understands about the burial of the body of Jesus, but hardly anybody understands the burial of his soul. And I'm telling you, that's a big deal. It's a bigger deal than the burial of the body. So in Acts, the second chapter, verse 27, Peter at Pentecost. In verse 24, uh, Peter says that God raised him up again. And prior to that, he says he, this verse 23 says, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, and they put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. From verse 25 through 28, he documents that belief by the word of God, the Old Testament passages. You know, he gives Psalm 16 and... and uh, and carries it through Psalm 16, at David's writing on that subject matter. And look at verse 27 on your uh, Acts 2, 227. In this Psalm 16, 8 through 11 passage that he's quoting to show you that the Messiah, Christ, has got to come. He's got to die on a cross, be buried, and be raised from the dead. What he focuses on here is his burial. Watch this. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades. That's, that's the Greek word for Sheol in the Hebrew. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. In other words, if it goes past three days, if the burial goes past three days, we learned that from Lazarus, then it, the body begins to decay in state. Now watch what he said there. You will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. All right? So look at verse 31 in the same context that he's preaching. He says, that David, talking about David's pro prophetic words, uh, David looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. They were, they were living witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted, that is, he, he has gone back to the third heaven as seated at right hand of God the Father, having therefore been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth, forth that which you both see and hear. That's Matthew 3. If you really want to know the background of that, that's Matthew 3, 11 and 12. So there is no doubt that the biggest part of the burial is not that his body is put in a tomb, is that his soul went to Sheol because it was from Sheol that he was raised from the dead. Go to Romans 9. Go to Romans 9. Let's see, Romans 8. Go to Romans 8. <laughs> 9. Eight nine Romans eight nine. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If the spirit of God dwells in you, and He does, if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised on the, uh, the the gospel, raised from the dead, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you. We live in the new covenant age. He indwells your body. 
1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He indwells your body, and your body is the temple of God. Because the Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead, dwells there. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. If Christ is in you, and he is, if you believe the gospel, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the, spirit, the human spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit, Holy Spirit, of him, watch this verse 11, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, how did Jesus get raised from the dead? The Holy Spirit raised him. Raised him from the dead. From Sheol. In Matthew, the 12th chapter, in Matthew, the 12th chapter, 38 through 40, Jesus gave us a doctrinal principle that he would be in burial three days and three nights. That's three complete days. And tells you where. Matthew 12, 38 through 40, tells you where. He says, in the heart of the earth, he will be in, heart, in the heart of the earth which is called Hades or Sheol, right? As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, Jonah 2.17 or 1.17. Jonah 1.17. All right? Now watch in verse 11. If the, if the Spirit, he does, the Spirit of him dwells in you, if at the moment you believe the gospel, he, it takes up residence because you live in the new covenant. That's the third member of the Godhead lives in you. You have a house address, right? It says that's where your body is most of the time. Probably at night. In other words, your body is the temple of God. When it goes to work, the temple goes to work. When it goes shopping, the temple goes shopping. When it goes to the gym, it goes to the gym. John 14, 16 tells you that when he takes up residence, he's not permitted to leave, ever. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your, what? mortal body. Give life to your mortal body. In other words, while your feet are on earth and you're in a mortal body, the Holy Spirit is the whole key to life in Christ. Do you pay any attention to that in your daily life? Do you pay any attention to that? You should. You should pay attention to that. You should now that you know what Jesus from the dead will also give life, give life to your what? Listen, your, the fact that you have a mortal body says it has life. It has physical life. He's not talking about physical life. He's talking about spiritual life. The life that comes from the Holy Spirit is spiritual life. You know, when the Holy Spirit takes up, he light, enlightens and lightens up your life. You've been in darkness, and now you're in light. You are children of light. And you, of all people, should know the difference between the darkness you used to live and the light you now live. You should choose the light. Well, here we are in Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. Because I've been in a study... I've been in a study with the people on, in my class on Sunday. I have said, just because I'm out there and I'm listening to people that don't, they, they just don't get it, don't understand it. And so it's important for me to make sure that you understand it so that you can help your friends. I said there are three doctrinal issues that are important to interpreting the scriptures regarding the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. These three doctrines are these. 
you need to know the four messianic Jewish holidays that Jesus had to fulfill had to fulfill to be the Messiah Savior. They're found in Leviticus 23, 1 through 22, and you ought to learn them. That's Pentecost, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost or Feast of Weeks. They're all linked. You got you, you have him died on cross, he's buried, he's raised. He ascends back to the Father and sends back the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, or Feast of Weeks. They're all linked in Leviticus, Leviticus 23. So don't be ignorant because you come here, we'll give you the truth. I'm going to tell you where you got it. People, you know, you're going to tell that, and people go, like, where do you get that? Anyway, I get it in the Bible. Don't tell them your pastor said, show them in the Bible. I give you scripture. You don't have to say, well, my pastor says. You don't have to say that. You can say the Bible says. The second thing is that there's a three-day and three-night, full, full three-day. Jesus cannot die on Friday, be buried on Saturday, and raised on Sunday, and have three full days. And people say, well, the part of days... Jesus made sure, God made sure in his divine plan that you wouldn't say, well, a part of a day is a whole day. Because he said, three days and three nights. That's a full day. By any standard, that's a full day. Well, you would if you had to work that whole 24 hours. <laughs> You'd understand it. All right? The other part I'm going to deal with today, and that's the Jewish timetable. People do not know that when we're in the, in the Gospels, we're in Jewish timetable. Listen to me now. The Jewish timetable goes from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's a 24-hour day. Not 12 to 12. That's a Gentile day. Now, you got to understand this. That's a Jewish timetable. you gotta, you got to understand that. And so... Today, I'm going to explain that to you. Point number one. We have studied the first two, the four Messianic holidays, in detail. We have studied the three days and three nights in detail. And now we're going to study the Jewish timetable in detail so that you have no problem when you get into these scriptures. All of this, if you did stay, to attend our studies, go to our website, look up Easter 23, and you can pick up all the stuff. We've studied the first two, and today we're going to study the Jewish timetable of a 24-hour day that consists of two 12-hour periods. Just like yours does. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm just telling you that the Jews didn't go from 12 to 12. They went from 6 to 6. 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. So I wrote it on your paper because one of the good things, I, I was down at Willie's place Friday. John was out of town, and so I filled in. I was down at Willie's place, and we were talking about this stuff. And it it and I, I and she's not Jones not here today, and I wish she was. Willie, you'll have to carry it back. She she, she went. Let, let me understand. I I think I'm a halfway smart person, so help me understand how this Jewish day works because it's hard to explain it because we always think in Gentile times. And uh, what with Gentile times sometimes is hard to understand. When we went to the military, it made, they made it really easy in the military. The first half of the day, they put it in zeros. <laughs> oh, something. So they made it easy for us to understand it. But everybody has different. So I wrote it on your paper so that you can understand. Here's how 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. a 24-hour day has two 12-hour periods, right? In it. And here's how it works. The Jewish day begins at 6 p.m. Therefore, it goes from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then it, then it goes from 7 a.m. It picks up at 7 a.m. and goes to 6 p.m. And then you have two 12-hour periods. Now, in Matthew, in Matthew 27... Watch this. I'm in Matthew 27, verse 45 and 46. Because if you don't understand Jewish time, you will never get this. 
And so I'm going to explain how it works. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. We're in the crucifixion of Christ. He's on the cross. He, they're talking about the last three hours on the cross. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All right? That's Psalms 22.1. He quoted the word of God. Now, look on the body of the paper so that you can understand how this stuff works. I put the Gentile time at the bottom of the second part, go from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. So that in, in Mark... Now hold your place in Matthew and go to Mark a moment because Mark's the only one that brings this piece of information to us. In Mark 15, 25, it tells us, Mark 15, I went 16, 15, should be in 25, that when they started the crucifixion, it was the third hour of the day. This is Passover now. Well, this 6 to 6 is Passover. The third hour, Mark 15, 25 says third hour. So the crucifixion, they got him to the site of the crucifixion, nailed him to the cross, put the cross up. Now we're at 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. We got six hours. He's on the cross six hours. The first three hours are unique from the second three hours, as we're going to discover. Look at verse 25 again, and notice your paper. So he goes to the crucifixion. Uh, draw, draw a circle. I, try, I tried to get him under each other, but I couldn't. Circle three and nine. Just circle that. Circle, circle the three and the nine, because the third hour is 9, 9 a.m., then go over see, 6, the Gentile time 6, circle it up over 12, that's noon. And then take the 9 and circle it around the 3. Because 3 p.m. is the ninth hour. So they talk about hours. They say the 3rd hour, the 6th hour, and the ninth hour. How, how do we interpret that? Well, you look at, you, you look at the Jewish time. And so you have 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. Jesus is going to die at 3 p.m. in the afternoon on Passover. You understand that? You have to, it, I, I can only write it down, I can't. The Jewish time, the, you got to run off the Jewish time. So I, I tried to show you from a Gentile view how that thing worked. They called them hours. They said it's the third hour. The third hour is 9 a.m. The sixth hour is our noon. And the ninth hour is 3 p.m. If you counted them, you could count them. And you'd get to the nine, right? In Jewish times, you just count them and get it. Okay, so it was important. In our discussion Friday, people were struggling with that. And I, I went home, wrote it down. I said, well, I got to make that simpler than what apparently I'm doing. I can't make it simpler than this. <laughs> if it be done, it won't be done by me. I can't do it. It's just pure math and numbers. So that's how you get that. Point number two. So remember, when you're dealing with this stuff in there, you go like, well, what's the sixth hour and all that? And In Matthew 27, 57 through 61, we're told that we're in the evening. In verse 57, it was it, it, talking about burial. It was evening, there was a rich man that came along. You know, Joseph and Nicodemus took the body and put it in the new tomb. Right? We're still at Passover. We're still on the 14th of Niacin. We're at three. Now they're in a big hurry because the Jewish day is going to change at 6 p.m. Now listen to me. The reason they're in a hurry to get the body off the cross and into a tomb, because the very next day is the 15th, the first day of unleavened bread, and the last day of unleavened bread were high Sabbaths. They, were, they were, weren't weekly Sabbaths, but they were considered by the way you conducted yourself as a Sabbath. 
They're called high sound. John 19, 30 and 31. They're called high Sabbaths or holy convocations. They're, they're viewed as like you would a weekly Sabbath, but they're not. They're based on dates, right? All, Leviticus 23 tells you it's Passover is always on the 14th. Then you have seven days. From the 15th to the 21st is always dates. The first, the 15th, and the 21st are, 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 then since you have seven days, there's going to be a weekly Sabbath, right? Yes. If you got seven days, you got to have a weekly Sabbath. Now that's a day, not a date. We wait till the Saturday comes. The, the seventh day comes, we call it Saturday. That's a weekly Sabbath during unleavened bread. Now, the very next day after the weekly Sabbath, is first fruits holiday. It's the holiday of first fruits. Oh my goodness. Now, if you've been with me now, I'm in my third lesson. Now, if you haven't been with me, you're behind. You're behind quite a, you're quite a ways behind. But look, I just teach. Look. Always, this is the way it always works. For centuries, this is the way it works. When it, always Unleavened bread always starts on the 15th, closes on the 21st. There's going to be a weekly Sabbath. You think this is where people get Jesus died on Friday, were buried on Saturday, and rose on Sunday. They, they, they don't understand this. You've got to understand it, church. Who's going to explain this? I can't go around and talk to all your friends about it. You've got to talk to your own friends about it. I'd be willing to go talk to your friends about it. But they're not going to put up with me. So, you really got to get this under, under, under your belt. You got to understand that. Whenever the weekly Sabbath of unleavened bread, the very next day was first fruits festival. And you counted seven full weeks. Seven times seven? 49 days. Se complete seven. And the 50th day is called the feast of, of uh, harvest. The the Feast of Weeks. We call it Pentecost. In Acts 2, it's called Pentecost. They took the Greek word rather than the Hebrew because that's where the church started. A whole new deal opened up. That's how you do this. See, you, these, gotta, these have to, they have, listen, for Christ to be the Messiah, everything, Matthew, write this down, Matthew 5.17, Christ has to fulfill the law. And so this is fulfilling the law. He's got to do Passover right on them. Everything has to be done by the letter of the... And so he's going to go Passover. He's going to go unleavened bread. Out of unleavened bread, the day after the weekly Sabbath, his first fruits festival, always. You count down to the 50th day from that. Pentecost. So when we read this, it was evening, and Joseph comes, and, they, and, and he gets the bodies because they're in a hurry at 6. The day closes at 9, and the, next, the very next minute after the F Passover closes, unleavened bread starts. If, that, if they're not off the cross, all three of those guys got to be off the cross and, and in the ground. Or the Jewish nation is going to be declared unclean. And they've got thousands of visitors from all over the country, and you can read about them in the second chapter of Acts, coming from 15 different nations with different languages. Well, you have to read the Bible, people. you got to read. Aren't you interested in this stuff? Why wouldn't you read this stuff? I'm just reading the Bible to you. It, it's just interesting. And, of course, all of this is based on Exodus 12, 1 through 20. you got to read that. You're never going to understand what I'm telling you unless you read this background. This is just background history. It ought to be interesting to you. In Matthew 28, in Matthew 28, 1 through 3, watch what he says. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn during the first, way of the, the first day of the week, what Sabbath is that? The weekly Sabbath. How do I know it? Because 
The weekly Sabbath, listen, the Sabbath is seven. This is the weekly Sabbath. The next day is first fruits. It's the first day of the week, right? Man, Sunday's the first day of the week. Just because you go to work on Monday don't mean it's the first day of the week. All right. First day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the grave. And I love verse 2. And behold, a severe earthquake occurred for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes white as snow. And the guards who had been sent to seal the tomb and to guard it became like dead men. Uh, ask, uh, uh, my mind just goes crazy with that. I'm not going to let it do it. Um, if I had you in a private class, we would have a lot of fun with those, those guards. I can promise you that. Because I find this really humorous. And listen to this. It's on the very bottom of your paper, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Oh, wow, I'm already out of time. Holy, holy. Well, let me finish this. I'll pick this back up next week. You'll get most of it by then. I'll probably push on, but but now Christ, watch verse, I'm in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Watch this. Talking about first fruits, he, he, his resurrection. Christ is going to come out of the grave on first fruits. He's going to be three days in the grave. Jesus is going to die on Wednesday. He's going to be buried Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. He's going to be out of the, he's, the grave, he's going to be out of the grave and the, and the tomb is declared empty. You know what they're going to say? You know what the angel is going to say? They're going to preach their first great sermon. He is risen. Don't let people lie. People just don't read the Bible. Read the Bible and know this stuff for yourself. Don't listen to Don't even listen to me. Don't even listen. I mean, listen to me in class. But you should, you should look up everything I tell you. All right? I could be sending, I could be selling you the London Bridge. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. Watch this now. I'm in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Where did that idea come from? <laughs> Where did that idea come from? Where did Paul get that? Well, he got it right out of the passages that teach about Jesus has got to die in the 14th, be married, buried 15, 16, 17, out of the tomb on the 18th. Oh, by the way, that was First Fruits Festival. Da 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 da. That's what he's talking about. Isn't that good? Well, I have more to say to you, but not now. All right. So I gave, I put it on your paper. My point is, I really want you to understand. These are key issues that people get all wrong, and they have the screwiest ideas about Easter. It ought to be a great celebration, and it, it is. And I don't fuss with people that, you know, I was with a pastor the other day. Well, I believe he was raised on Friday, buried on Saturday, and raised on Sunday. I don't fuss with him. I said, well, do you know that's the gospel, that he died, was buried, and raised from the dead? He went, I sure do. And I said, well, then, brother... I love that. I don't go fuss with him about that. If he wanted to know, I'd take him into the passage and teach him what I learned. But look, I'm not going to fuss with him. If you believe the gospel, that's all I'm after, at, right? I'm after the gospel. If you believe, listen, you've got to believe the gospel. Going to church is not going to get you to heaven. Going to church is not going to get you to heaven. Going to church tells you that you're on your way. I'm one of those people, I'm on way. The way to heaven is Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Eh, that's a narrow gate. It depends on what the cross is to you. Depends on what that is to you. But I'm telling you, here's the secret. You get in by faith. You got to believe the gospel. You got to believe it. You got to believe it. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study this Easter special with us. Up from the grave he arose. Mm. 
I wonder, did they realize how deep that grave was? Jesus said it was in the heart of the earth. Paul quotes in Ephesians 4.9 that it was in the lower parts of the earth. Up from the grave he arose. Yeah. Yeah. Next week we'll talk about it. Up from the grave he arose. Hmm. And why did he go to Hades? We'll explain it next week. So, Father, we thank you today. I pray, Father, as we take an offering, those who are visiting with us would understand this meal's been paid. But it's the privilege, the attitude of gratitude that we give any part of our, our life, any part of our life to God. It's an attitude of gratitude. We thank you, Father, that you're always faithful to keep your mission work moving forward in ministry. And we're glad to be a part of that. In Jesus' name, amen.